From WBGO, this is Newark Today, your monthly look at what's happening in and around New Jersey's largest city. And now, here's your host, Michael Hill. Welcome to another edition of Newark Today on WBGO 88.3 FM and WBGO.org. This is our first show of this new year. This is January 17th, 2019, a whole new year. And Newark has some really good news to share with a lot of the folks out there listening tonight. We want you to chime in. Uh, Tell us what your thoughts are as we have this discussion about crime decreasing in the city of Newark, uh, some of the lowest crime numbers in five decades, going all the way back to the 1960s. Is that right, Mr. Ambrose, if my math is correct? Correct. And the number for you to chime in here, give us uh, your thoughts, tell us what you think, express your concerns, a question, whatever you have there. The number to call is one 877 9283 that's 844-677-9283 or you can tweet us at newark today that's newark <coughs> today we are talking about crime tonight our guests of course the honorable mayor of newark Raz baraka city of newark public safety director anthony ambrose in our second half hour christine ferro of the essex county rape crisis center and also robert barron of the new jersey coalition against sexual assault will join us by phone to talk about some of the funding in terms of battling uh, rapes and sexual assaults in this state and reaching out and helping some of the folks who are in New Jersey and being sexually assaulted and how they are being helped with public funds and so forth. Before we talk about crime, though, there's something else we want to talk to you about. On January 14th this week, three days ago, the mayor of Newark, who's in the studio with us now, (laughs) sent a letter to the president of the United States, the Honorable Donald J. Trump, president of the United States, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, Washington, D.C., 20500. And the letter, if I may, the letter from the mayor of Newark, he sent this by snail mail, as the people say, and he also tweeted this to the, uh, to the president, if I'm correct. And it says, I am writing to express my deep concern that you are seriously thinking of declaring a national emergency to fund a proposed $5 billion border wall. I want to bring to your attention to a true emergency that puts millions of our citizens at risk. That's the decaying infrastructure of our water systems, which has created a crisis in Newark the state of New Jersey, and across America. Dangerously high levels of lead are entering homes in our children's blood through lead service lines, despite the fact that any level of lead can damage the developing brains of young children. Mr. Mayor, your thoughts. Why would you send this? Uh, For a few reasons. Um, One, uh, the government is shut down, and uh, we were presently working on getting additional dollars from uh, Senator Booker and Congressman Pallone, uh, working on opportunity for us to uh, put take money from one fund, put it in another fund, so the state of New Jersey can use it to supplement what we've already begun to do in terms of replacing the lead service lines. We we can't even do that now because the government is shut down. And then if you contemplate why the government is shut down, there's about $5 billion about a wall that they're arguing about, which seems to be nonsensical to me, uh, that there's a real crisis going on that I think will get bipartisan support, you know, infrastructure, uh, improvement as it relates to the health and welfare of the young people in our in our country, uh, and I, I think that that is more important uh, than this wall. And I think it is a good way to spend that money. You also write in the second paragraph in prioritizing environmental justice, saving children and their families within these cities is a must. Although the situation in Newark is very different from that of Flint, our need to replace lead service lines is equally urgent. I join in solidarity with the 11 year old girl known as Little Miss Flint who told you that spending $5 billion to make water safe is a much better way to protect Americans than building the wall. Absolutely. Uh, you, you, when you <clears throat> sent this, and there's certainly been a lot of uh, talk about this, have have other mayors, other elected officials reached out to you and said, amen, way to go, we, we're in your corner with this? Well, yeah, a lot of elected officials, you know, agree with that on his face. Like, yep, this is right, we should be doing this. Particularly since now you see... Uh, in New Jersey that this is larger uh, than people even anticipated. I mean, the Suez uh, company up in, in Bergen County, yeah, right. County just announced that they have high levels left. But you're talking about 22 municipalities in the state of New Jersey that have this issue. So other folks are saying, yeah, we need help. And if New Jersey is having this kind of an issue, then certainly there are other states out there with, sure. old, with infrastructure equally as yeah. old as New Jersey's. 
Yep. And we we talking the billions and billions of dollars across the country that this would cost uh, to get fixed. Uh, 70 million in Newark alone, hundreds of million in the state of New Jersey. So because of the government shutdown right now, partial shutdown as they call it, Money is not coming to Newark to replace these lead service lines. Well, additional money. Additional money. Right. We we have money from the state now and money that we've bonded that we're going to use to begin this year. About 1,500 lead service lines will, will be replaced at the begin, begin at the beginning of this year. Uh, but we have 20,000 homes that we have to replace lead service lines for. So uh, we are going to need more money. I, absolutely. I'm going to read this last paragraph here, and then I'll, we'll get to the crime uh, statistics. Uh, and, and you say this, uh, you have been saying that a border wall will save thousands of American lives, but that's simply not true. Instead of wasting billions of dollars to keep an ill-conceived campaign promise, I urge you to use our resources in a way that will truly save American lives. Lives Help repair our nation's deteriorated water infrastructure. What kind of, it, it, what kind of response, realistically, do you expect from this president when you tell him, of all people, right. that you're not telling the truth and there's a better way to do this? Well, you know, uh, first, I don't have, you know, I always say I don't have the luxury of pessimism or, or cynicism. I have to always believe something positive is going to take place out of this. I, I, I'm not going to cross my fingers or hold my breath, though. Uh, but I, I thought I thought it needed to be said. Um, and, you know, you know, ask not, you know, uh, you know, what not, you know. So at the end of the day, we have to push for what we need and what we want and make people understand what the real emergencies are. And prayerfully, maybe somebody in his administration or he gets a epiphany to say, look, maybe we need to listen to what the mayor of Newark said. <laughs> <laughs> that would be an even bigger story, sir. <laughs> All right, let's talk about some of the uh, the crime stats. Uh, earlier this year, you held a news conference. Uh, you, Mr. Mayor, and the police superintendent, public safety uh, director, Anthony Ambrose, talked about uh, crime in the city of Newark and some of the lowest numbers in five decades. Um, how did this happen? We'll go through some of these numbers in a second, but how, how do you explain that some of the lowest crime numbers uh, in Newark in the last five decades? Well, I'll let the public safety director okay. chime in on that. And uh, But I, I want to say like this, the victims of crime are, are is a lot less. When I was going to college in 1986, on my way to college, we had about 40,000 victims of crime. Now we're, we're about 8,000 now, I mean, uh, four years ago, we had you know the carjackings were through the roof, with, like down eighty percent in carjackings. Those are that's huge, and though you know a lot of people, if you're a victim of crime, obviously you're gonna you know say this or say that. Uh, this doesn't mean anything, but the reality is it, it, it means something for the lives that were saved, uh, that were not wasted senselessly to crime and violence in the streets because of the work that the police department and and, and the police department's partners have done to to reduce crime in the city. Good, Mr. Ambrose. Uh, yeah, I like to start by saying uh, it's progress. Uh, you know, we we're not claiming that we that it's victory. We won, but I think that it starts with uh, you know there's a lot of components. I think the first component is the hardworking uh, men and women of the police division. I think collaboration with our state, local, federal government is is very Im important. Uh, I think it's important our citizens that work with us and our cameras, our our 125 new cameras with 8,000 people that are registered. Uh, that call up and, and, and that monitor them cameras. So it's not just one one thing that we've done uh, that re reduced the, the crime this year to the lowest. Uh, but uh, I think that it's 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 basically uh, things that we've been doing over the last three and a half years. Uh, that, that means it. I think adding, uh, since the mayor came on board, we added 100, 500 officers were hired, but actually 180 uh, more officers than when he was elected. Uh, the attrition rate was able to be uh, people were, were hired to fill the attrition. The structure of the department was, was rebuilt. Uh, and, and doing all of this, and we still uh, started a consent decree in, in July of 2016. So uh, I think that the most, one of the, the important things are working together in collaboration. Uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office was very instrumental. We're not going to arrest our way out of this in, in no way, but uh, 125 uh, investigations that the U.S. Attorney's Office, the worst of the worst, dealing with gun violence. Uh, was very important. The state police coming in to assist us early on, uh, the Essex County Prosecutor's Office and Sheriff's Department. So uh, I think that, the, you know, uh, without the collaboration, uh, without the cameras, without the vision uh, of the men and women that, that we set forth, uh, we wouldn't be that successful. We're talking crime tonight, crime stats, crime dropping in the city of Newark, some of the lowest numbers in the last five decades. We want you to have 
uh, a say in this. Uh, the mayor is here. The public safety director is here. We want you to chime in, your questions, your concerns. The number to call here on WBGO, Newark Today, is 844-677-9283. That's 844-677-9283, or tweet us at Newark Today. Uh, Mr. Ambrose, I want to go back to something here. Well, first of all, let me go through these uh, crime numbers so folks will have a good idea of what the, uh, the framework is we're talking about. Uh, property and violent crime in Newark are down 15% from last year. That's the lowest dip in crime, as we said, in 50 years. There were 69 homicides in Newark in 2018 compared to 72 in the year before, three less um, in uh, this uh, last year. 101 fewer shooting victims this year, down from 337 last year. That is a huge drop. Carjackings, uh, as the mayor has mentioned, uh, carjackings have decreased by 142 to 62 between 2017 and 2018. Automobile theft has decreased from 2335 to 1951 uh, between the same time frame. Assaults with other weapons like knives have risen with a 10% hike in knife assaults between 2017 and 2018. I put an asterisk by that one. And rapes also increased from 140 to 165, according to city city uh, information. Uh, let me go back to something here. Are we seeing knife assaults up because uh, there are fewer crimes, or there's more, there, there's less access to guns? Do you think? Uh, it, there's there's a combination. Uh, a lot of these assaults with knives uh, are, are younger, are 18, 19 year old kids okay. uh, that are doing it. Uh, some of them are, are domestic related. Uh, so, uh, but I, I have to say that we recovered 566 guns, which was a record uh, from the last three years. Uh, just our division, not 200 more from the state, federal, and local authorities. So, almost 800 guns that were recovered, and quite a few uh, assault weapons uh, over the last year. Uh, darn near, uh, I want to say uh, about 48 assault weapons were recovered out of these. Wow. What's an assault weapon doing in, assault, a, in an urban exactly, area? Yeah. Exactly. Let me ask you this. 566 guns seized. Where are these guns coming from? Mainly uh, you get them from west Pennsylvania area and down south along the I-95 corridor. You know, it's funny that you mention that. We have the strictest gun laws in the state of New Jersey, but yet it's pathetic. The guns that find their way up here uh, through, through the Carolinas and through Pennsylvania. Now, when you mention gun crimes and gun prosecutions, are some of these prosecutions having to do with not just people who are in possession of these guns illegally? What about people who are trafficking in guns? Uh, well, that's that's one of our federal partners, the uh, ATF, Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearm. Uh, we have people from that uh, a, a division in, embedded in, with our North Police Department. Uh, for years, we've never seen that at all. So they, they've uh, had a, a takedown not too long ago. Uh, where we took down a, a, a slew of people that were involved in, in, in violence in the city, in gun trafficking, uh, gun possession. So, you know, all of it comes together and all it helps for that 15% reduction and, in, in, you know, the 1,300 less victims from last year. Don't you wish you could put up a, a um, Mr. Mayor, I'm not going to say a wall, but a border or something <laughs> so, that, so that you could keep the illegal guns out? <laughs> Uh, we we have. It wouldn't uh, cost you five billion dollars either. No, it would just. Uh, but I, I think that uh, working together uh, and, and and concentrating in better intelligence, which we have, uh, has a lot of a lot of uh, uh, insight on on this uh, uh, success. Now maybe I missed this. You said five hundred and sixty six guns last year. How does that comp compare to previous years? Uh, the year before we uh, five hundred and thirty two. So it's still a high number. Oh, high number. The year before that was uh, uh, almost five hundred. So every year it went up more and more. And are the, the people who are possessing these illegal guns, are, uh, are, are they getting, in, in terms of possessors, younger and younger, you're finding? Or are they typically Anywhere from age uh, 22 to age 36, y you're seeing them possessing. Wow. Mr. Mayor, th these numbers are, uh, I think for a lot of people, they're impressive. The public safety director ran down some of the reasons that the, uh, the crime is dropping here. Rapes, though, increased, as we said, mm -hmm. from 140 to 165 mm -hmm. in the city. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, on, on two of those things, I think there's a, a myriad of reasons why I believe that 
crime is down. You know, we also have lower unemployment numbers than we've had in a long time. We also have the organization like Newark Community Street Team, Newark Street Academy. I think we have a better relationship with the community than we've ever had uh, in the city. I mean, so all of those things are, are factors. But, you know, a, a lot of these, the, the things that you see, the reclassifications of a lot of these, uh, you know, crimes that are happening, whether you're talking about aggravated assault or rape, there's a lot of new new categories that are added to these that make those numbers a high, but it's still an inordinate amount of uh, you kind of rape and domestic violence in the city, which is a lot more personal and a lot more difficult to predict, uh, you know, what's going to happen. And so we need other strategies uh, to kind of begin to figure that out. Uh, and we've been talking about it, like uh, other ways to intervene in domestic violence before it turns to a homicide or aggravated assault. You're talking about prevention. Oh, yeah, prevention uh, and intervention. So mm-hmm. in- intervening in a situation that could become bad. Or, 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 and more education to prevent or let, allow people to see signs of abuse, uh, you know. And uh, a lot of these things are personal, meaning, meaning people know these folks um, and, you know, they turn into situations uh, if folks had intervention or help somewhere in the beginning or the middle, it may prevent some of this stuff from taking place. You're listening to Newark Today. That's the mayor of Newark, Raz Baraka, along with the public safety director, Anthony Ambrose. Uh, this is Newark Today. The number to call is 844-677-9283. Surely, if you're a resident of Newark, you have some questions, some concerns about crime and public safety in New Jersey's largest city. We'd like to hear from you. 844-677-9283. Mr. Mayor, a couple of years ago, the Shawnee Baraka uh, Women's Resource Center opened over on Clinton Avenue, named right. after your, your late sister. Uh, how is that working in, in your estimation? Now, we talked to somebody earlier who said there are a lot of uh, people coming in there uh, seeking resources and sure. so forth. How's it working out so far? I mean, I, I would say it's, it's, it's working out pretty average. In, in my mind, I think it's a good job, good work. You got the police fo- uh, folks over there. People are using it. Uh, it is highlighting domestic violence and, and issues involving sexual assault and other things as it relates to women, uh, something that didn't exist before. I think we have to figure out a way to be, make it m- a lot more effective uh, than what it is, Put more, e- e- either put more resources there, um, you know, uh, begin to figure out other strategies that we need to use uh, to get more women in there and then begin to connect them to real services outside of just the Shani Baraka Center. Um, so I, I think it's a great thing, and it, and it started off at a, an incredible uh, rate. You know, we got thousands of women who are using that facility. Uh, we just have to continue to build on it to make it more and more effective. Do you think those the, the, the people who are coming to the Shawnee Baraka Women's Resource Center, do you think that they would be seeking services, seeking help if the center was not there, if they had to go downtown if they had to go to the west border if they had to go across town no i i I think that you know uh it's difficult for people who are in those situations to seek help period i mean sometimes they don't want help uh for various reasons i mean um some they don't want to get other people involved you know or they're afraid or it's dangerous or they depend on this situation for their livelihood so there are a lot of reasons behind that, and they, they, they usually don't want assistance at all. So to make them travel or go somewhere out, outside of their comfort zone would add a, another barrier to it as well. But to be able to have something close to you and have people in there that, uh, you know, that resemble you, that went through these conditions and situations, make it easier for you to confide in, uh, uh, in those folks. And having a, the police station right next door to it is great because now you could uh, actually file charges and do other kinds of things that, that is necessary as well. I was going to ask you that. Uh, is, it, is it a situation, as far as we know, where uh, because of the center and because uh, it's there and perhaps because of the Me Too movement, that it's making it easier for people to come forward in some of these cases, uh, sexual assault cases, domestic violence cases, and to participate in, in, in the system, not just seeking help, but right. knowing that that's a safe place to go. Law enforcement is there. Somebody I can talk to. Somebody can get the ball rolling to. I'm not just getting services, but I want justice. Well, that's the idea. And uh, hopefully it's, it's um, you know, uh, rolling out that way. I know a lot, a lot of folks do do that. And um, it's important that we make sure that that is uh, almost systemic when, when folks come in there. That is just not uh, incidental that it happens because we are very deliberate and intentional about it. 
Mr. Ambrose, anything you'd like to add on, on that line in terms of uh, people coming forward, going to the resource center, going other places um, in the city, and is it making it easier to bring cases to court as far as you know? Uh, yes. W one thing I have to say is it's a one-stop shop. Uh, before right. you would have to bring it to, to the police department, then we would have to refer it to uh, any social services. Uh, we have, we have uh, uh, people that are on, on site that are trained, uh, that are social workers uh, in, the, in the building. Um, so, yeah, uh, people are more, uh, you know, uh, more, more prone to come in now and, uh, and, and, and to go, you know, you go to the police side to the left, you go to the social services and, and to the right. Uh, so a lot of times they'll talk to the right first and they'll talk and it, well, it might be a police matter. Then they walk over to the police, the police side or the police side will walk into the social side. So there's co and, and, and then people, uh, are, are, we find it are more apt to come. Um, we see that since the Shiny Baraka Center opened that uh, we've, we've had like a 12% a repeat offenders prior to the opening. Uh, last year we had like an 8% repeat offenders. So that's our measurement to see if, see if it's working. And uh, we have, uh, you know, a uh, domestic violence response teams uh, that that also work out of there. So it's like anything else. Uh, you know, it, it's new. It's still new. Uh, people have to learn it, uh, and, and we do advertise it. You don't have to become a, a victim, as the mayor talked about intervention, uh, intervention and prevention. The intervention is just important for the repeat offenders. Uh, when you talk about uh, the, the crime coming down uh, in Newark, I noticed that the uh, auto theft, automobile theft, the mayor mentioned this too, that uh, uh, used to be a, a period where Newark was kind of known as the carjacking capital, as some outsiders used to call it. But auto theft uh, has decreased uh, 2335 to 1951 between 2017 and 2018. Are uh, uh, car thieves getting the message in some way? Well, I would, I would like the police to take credit for it, but you have to realize that when we were the car jacking or the stolen car capital of the world, we had almost 16,000 cars in, 19, uh, in 1995. Uh, you have to realize that automobile manufacturers definitely enhanced their security, uh, and, and that has, that's a big help. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of these cars, believe it or not, uh, with the winter months, they leave their cars running. Uh, about 4% of these cars are taken while the cars are running in the driveway or in the front of their houses. Um, and then we have the same problem in the wintertime, in the summertime, when they leave them running for the air conditioning on. So uh, it's a crime of opportunity, but the big drops are, 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 are uh, um, better prosecution and definitely better, uh, better uh, security enhancement. Um, uh, there's a comment we have from uh, Suzanne uh, Jablonski on Facebook, and it says, rewriting the narrative of uh, Newark, thank goodness for the Shawnee Barack Women's Resource Center in Essex County for uh, Family Justice Center, and she's a uh, DV survivor, as I understand it. So, um, folks, they're listening, Mr. Mayor, and, and praising the center. That's a good thing. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. I also want to talk about, uh, Mr. Ambrose, you mentioned 125 cameras, y y you mentioned? Yes. What do those cameras do? Uh, two years ago, uh, uh, the, the mayor uh, actually uh, uh, tasked us with uh, making sure that uh, Cameras that were already up that been destroyed uh, through the hurricane uh, that that we go and we replace them and add to them. So uh, we we receive funding uh, through UASI, uh, federal and, and state funding, and we were able to replace cameras and add. So we have 125 cameras citywide. Uh, we have it where people can can register and can monitor their areas rather than looking out a window and being identified. And uh, we found, we, our, our uh, analysis is, in the areas where the cameras are, crime dropped 4% right there in them areas. Because people know people, that... 8,000 registered recipients uh, watch, the, uh, watch the cameras. And residents, uh, how do they go on and, and, and find these cameras? Is there a website they can go on to? Yeah. Uh, we'll there, get that. There, there is a website okay. I can give you. We'll get that. Right. Okay. And uh, are these cameras, any of the, the recordings used for prosecution in any way? Uh, yes. Yes, there's, they're, they're used for that. They're used for uh, further investigation on open air, air drug sales. Uh, some would call up and say, you know, there's a male with a red sweatshirt s selling drugs. We immediately go to it uh, through investigation. We get them identified. So, so it's, it's, it's deterrent. It's used for a deterrent, and plus it's used for prosecution and for further investigation. And giving the public some confidence. Very much, very much, and that's why I call them a partner in fighting crime because they're a true partner. What kind of cooperation in general are you getting from the residents of Newark in terms of fighting crime? Because in, 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 in a lot of cities, in a lot of places, there are people who 
witness violence, witness crimes, and don't want to participate for fear of retaliation? Uh, it still exists, but I have to say, uh, over my years, and and there's more and more people. Uh, you know, if you if you restore the trust in the police department, uh, we see that we have we have a pretty good relationship with the public, uh, and the public does come forward, uh, and they're anonymous, and and and, and sometimes they they don't want to be anonymous. They're willing to come forward and give their name and say, this is what I've seen, and this is what I want to do about it. What do you think has given them that confidence? Well, like I said, I, I think that uh, they're seeing, uh, you know, you're seeing more and more people like, you know, go, going to jail and staying in jail. You're not seeing that person back on the street, uh, you know, that had possessed the gun or did a shooting. Uh, so I, I think that's big. Uh, you know, as I said before, the federal government, uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office took 125 cases, the worst of the worst. So them individuals are off the street here for a while, and hopefully for a long time, uh, if if they're uh, if they're convicted of the crimes that they're charged. There, are, there, are, Mr. Mayor, I want to bring you in on, on this too. There are people out there who are listening to this broadcast, and for the last year and a half, two years or so, looking at bail reform in New Jersey, where it's no longer based on uh, whether someone gets out of jail if they're charged with a crime, not based on whether they can they can afford to pay bail. It's based on a set of criteria as to whether this person is a danger to the community, will show up for trial, and things like that. Here we are talking about crime decreasing in the city of Newark, some of the lowest crime stats in the last five decades, two years after we had bail reform here. How do you explain that? Well, as you know, I, I, I'm not a, I was never a proponent of it, uh, but I have to say that with some of the changes that were made uh, by the AOC and by the prosecutor's office and the attorney general, uh, former attorney general Perino, uh, we were able to see people that were arrested with gun possession where they were being released weren't being released anymore. We've also talked to the, the, to the new attorney general and, and the AOC about property crimes that have, you know, not only one property crime or one stolen car, but three stolen cars or, you know, uh, burglaries. So, you know, we're, we're seeing, uh, we're, it's, it's now we're in our second year of it. So, we're, you know, we're seeing that that can also be attributed to it, but um, uh, I'm not going to put the flag up and say we won on bail reform. Mm. But 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 the tweaks to bail reform, you think, are are, are are the tweaks make it more sensible than, in your opinion, it may have may have been before in terms of yeah. just releasing people. Yeah, w- without a doubt. I mean, you know, early on, uh, you know, where we see people released, you got to realize in the city of Newark, we have bail reform, but also the prosecutor's office took off prosecutor screening. So when we lock someone up for, uh, say, um, uh, eighty decks of heroin. Uh, that would normally go go into go into be remanded to the the Essex County Correctional. Then people are it's being downgraded right there at the time of the arrest. So it's going as a DP. So our municipal courts getting getting it, right. and you're going right back on the street. So that's where a person that's possessing that type of drug and if he has a violent past, that's coming back to to, to hurt us. But uh, you know when you, you get people that come into our city from out of, from out of county or out of, out of our city and other municipalities in Essex County or contiguous counties that come in to buy drugs here, we get them a large amount, when I say 40, 80 uh, decks of heroin, that they're being released before the paperwork's done. So that's, that's, a, that's a chilling effect uh, that I have to say on the bail, the bail reform, and, and it's being downgraded. And it's really not bail reform. Bail reform is something totally different. This is prosecutor screening that, that actually hurts us. Okay, we have another Facebook posting. I want to read this one, too. This is from Nicholas uh, Carmentang. He wants to know, what more can the director, Ambrose, give us about the recent drug bust on Newark East Orange border, 59 busted? 59 people. Uh, it was an uh, investigation that started in October. Uh, the Essex County Prosecutor's Office was the lead. Uh, there have been people from the East Orange Police and the Newark Police assigned to it, uh, 59 people. Uh, there has been... Uh, 18 firearms, five of them were assault weapons. Uh, about $80,000 in cash was recovered. Uh, they were dealing, and, and so they arrested dealers and buyers along the border that were uh, engaging in open air drug markets. And what kind of drugs are we talking about? From fentanyl to marijuana, heroin. So there's a variety of drugs. That fentanyl stuff is really is, is some of the worst stuff out there. It, are, are these the kind of people, though, who are going to be? I know you had concerns about them going through municipal court, but are these the kind of folks who are going to be in jail, stay in jail for a while? Or uh, the, 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 A lot of these individuals were gun possessors and, and with the fentanyl, and a lot of them uh, still rem- are remanded to uh, jail. So potentially you saved a few lives by this fentanyl not 
making its way to. Exactly. At the press conference yesterday, we talked about the them 18 firearms, the lives that were saved, and also the drugs, the fentanyl, uh, that was, and heroin uh, definitely saved lives. So it was a grand slam by that, uh, by that investigation. We're talking about crime in Newark, the city of Newark, New Jersey's largest city. Some of the lowest numbers in crime stats in the last five decades. Our guest this evening, the Public Safety Director, Anthony Ambrose, of course, the Honorable Mayor of Newark, Raz Baraka. And coming up in our second half hour, we'll have some folks about uh, uh, Christine Farrow and Robert Baran. Uh, Baron will join us as well. The number to call here is 844-677-9283. This is the second half hour of Newark Today on this Thursday, January 17th, our first show of the 2019 New Year. We are talking about crime in the city of Newark and how crime has decreased some of the lowest numbers uh, overall in the last five decades or so. Our guest, of course, the Honorable Mayor of Newark, Raz Baraka, the Public Safety Director, Anthony Ambrose, and joining us here in studio, Christine Farrow, Essex County Rape Crisis Center. Christine, thank, thank you. you. And also Robert Barron is on the phone with us. He's with the New Jersey Coalition Against Sexual Assault. Uh, we were talking our last half hour about uh, some of the sexual assaults. One of the stubborn issues, and this is not just in Newark, I would imagine, Christine. Uh, I, I think New York City has an issue with this, and so do some other jurisdictions, is that rapes, sexual assaults increased in the city of Newark, for instance, from 140 to 165, according to the city's uh, information. Uh, welcome to the broadcast, Thank Christine. You. Uh, there are a lot of people who say that uh, these kinds of numbers are going up because more people are reporting. Is that the case from your perspective? I think it is the case. Um, given the Me Too movement, the emphasis on sexual violence in the media and the focus on, um, you know, people coming forward about sexual violence is giving people the courage to move forward. For us um, in Essex County, we've seen an increase of about 25 percent in people seeking out counseling services from 2017 to 2018. That's a sizable jump. That is a sizable jump. Um, and these people that are coming forward are not saying that they were raped last week or they were assaulted last month, but rather that they were assaulted 10 years ago in their childhood. So that shows us that people are now finding the courage to come forward and want to actually talk about it. So yes, there could be more assaults mm -hmm. happening, but we really think that it's because of people are coming forward and reporting and the partnership that we have with the Shawnee Baraka Women's Resource Center in Newark um, and having a, we're located in Montclair, our main office, but now we have someone on site at the Shawnee Baraka Center where we have provided on-site crisis intervention services for people to come in and they could walk in and meet with one of our crisis intervention specialists um, is really giving people the you know the courage and saying we're here for you we're listening we're ready to help and um, you know I credit the mayor for really starting this center to really show that domestic violence and sexual violence is an issue and that we're paying attention to it. Mr. Mayor a 25 percent increase in the folks coming in that uh, Christine is talking about mm -hmm, mm -hmm. seeking help that's a sizable number. Yeah, it is sizable, and I think she's uh, right on it that, you know, the ap the environment atmosphere is making it uh, easier for people to come forward and, you know, report and say different things. Uh, and then being able to go to a center like that also is encouraging for people that they have the kind of protection that they need and support that they need to be able to do that. Is is, is part of it the, the Me Too movement, as Christine uh, said, because when we start talking about Me Too movement, there's a lot of there are a lot of moving parts to this. And some of those moving parts uh, kind of took place in 2017. You had someone who was elected to the highest office in the land based on this uh, this uh, uh, as people seem to ignore this recording where he was talking about uh, doing something uh, vulgar to, uh, to to a woman. You had 2017 where there were a lot of powerful men in very big positions in, uh, of authority and so forth who were brought down with accusations of, of, of sexual assault. That's giving people confidence to come forward, you think? I, th I think so. I think that that uh, gives people at least momentum, right? And I think ultimately when you're in a situation, it is very local for you. So, you know, it's different than this guy is like, some big person on TV and, you know, you feel protected, but a person you know in your community and your household and your family is a lot more difficult to come forward about as opposed to, you know, somebody that's on TV, you know? So you need a lot more support and protection in those situations uh, because these people are not uh, being tried in the media, 
right? They're not being tried on social media or on Channel 4, 7, and 2, right? So Or NJTV. Or NJTV, my right. brother. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I want to bring in uh, Robert Barron, New Jersey Coalition Against Sexual Assault. Robert, you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you, Michael. Uh, you're welcome, sir. What can you tell us about the rest of the state? Christine was talking about a 25% increase in Essex County in some of the reporting of, of people coming in and, and seeking seeking services. What about for the rest of the state? And we have seen over the last uh, 18 months or so um, our programs reporting across the state that they have seen an increase, uh, whether it's an increase in crisis calls uh, where they do accompaniment uh within days of the actual assault uh, or overall counseling, where, as Christine alluded to, um, folks are coming in to report and seek support for uh, events that happened many years ago. Um, And we do have folks attributing that to uh, these high-profile cases that are getting a lot of attention. Um, And folks are really paying attention to how communities, how society responds to folks who come forward. Uh, and we have seen in the ebbs and flows, and this is reflected not just within New Jersey, but nationally as well, uh, that when there are high-profile cases that are uh, playing out on TV uh, through other formats, uh, that calls the hotline, people seeking out services, that increases. But if the outcome in those cases uh, don't seem to represent justice for survivors, we often see a uh, significant drop in utilization afterwards. Um, So folks are paying attention to uh, how folks are being treated in the media, how their family members are talking about folks who come forward, um, and then however justice is defined for for individuals, if they feel justice has not been reached, um, we see a significant decrease. Uh, But then cases such as um, the U.S. Olympics uh, gymnastics case with uh, Larry Nassar, um, we see folks feel emboldened to come forward and that they too might have access to justice. Robert, what what is it about seeing uh, the psychology of this? What is it about seeing these uh, mostly men, powerful men in positions of authority in the news, being accused, losing their positions of authority? What, what's the psychology there that if if someone can report that they have done something in a sexual way, a sexual assault against someone, and these allegations are being taken seriously is it, it, and that it, regardless of what position someone holds they're still going to be held accountable uh so i mean we we know across the board uh, the fbi recognizes that sexual assault and rape is the most underreported crime so there are a lot of factors that go into folks not reporting um but if you're asking kind of what might deter individuals from perpetrating um no not perpetrating my, my, my question is if you see uh some of the big names out there who are uh being accused of these crimes and uh these allegations are being investigated and taken seriously and it, and if this can happen to them in terms of losing their positions and being investigated that that encourages people to come forward and say look uh this happened to me i'm i'm and i want something done yeah, I think it's, it shows that there may be the start of a shift of power. And we know that sexual assault is a power-based crime and a power-based act um, where somebody is uh, exerting and exploiting a power differential. So if folks start to say, hey, even the most powerful and the people that have access to these institutions of power might actually uh, be held accountable, then perhaps now is a time where the cost that I incur for coming forward and making a report, because sadly there still still is a cost that survivors incur um, as folks choose not to believe them, question their account. Um, I mean, we've seen in some high-profile cases survivors getting death threats for coming forward and accusing powerful men. So survivors weigh that out, and if they say there's a chance that this person could be held accountable and perhaps be prevented from, from harming somebody else, then I'm willing to take that chance. And I think that that uh, contributes to more folks coming forward. You're listening to Newark Today on WBGO 88.3 FM. The number to call is 844-677-9283. That's 844-677-9283. Or you can tweet us at Newark Today. Mr. Ambrose, uh, one of the things that uh, is always happening in these kinds of cases when you start talking about rape and sexual assault you as a police department, you as the person and, and who's head of the department that gathers the facts in this case, you can have all the facts in the world, but that doesn't necessarily guarantee a conviction in that's, these kinds of cases. That's correct. Uh, here, here in Newark, New Jersey, one thing that I will add to this, in 2015, 
the, uh, the FBI changed the reporting under the Uniform Crime Reporting, where uh, certain types of, of, of sexual assaults now are aggravated sexual assaults that are investigated totally differently and recorded differently. The other part of Newark, New Jersey, we see that uh, the stranger to stranger race rapes are, 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 are very minimal. However, incest, and, and domestic violent rapes, either an ex-boyfriend or ex-husband or current boyfriend, current husband, uh, that's where we see most of our uh, rapes that occur. That domestic violence thing just keeps coming up, doesn't it? Yes, it does. All right. Christine, your, your thoughts on, on what, what are you getting to help these victims, these women, mainly women who are coming in and seeking help what are you what are you getting what are you giving them are you getting enough resources to help them so um yeah so you mentioned you reference women we do have actually a lot of men coming forward now more so than in the past so i think the me too movement has impacted men um as well people who identify as male to come forward as well and, what, um, and, and be, let me stop you yes. there pardon and what are what's their common complaint when they come in that someone has done something to them so our first our first usual encounter with um someone who's been sexually assaulted is usually in the hospital because we're part of the county sexual assault response team so when someone's sexually assaulted within a five-day period they could get evidence collected so our first interaction is usually at the hospital to help them through the evidence collection process um you know through all medical kind of uh, proceedings we bring clothing with us there so usually they're going to go in there and they're talking about what immediately happened to them that's usually our first interaction with the survivor survivor and they're reporting a sexual assault. They often don't have to report to the police if they do get um, medical attention. They don't have to report it to the police if they choose not to. Are you getting the resources you need, financial resources, to meet this increase in, in folks who are coming forward? Um, we are not because it is very difficult to, um, we're an independent nonprofit, so we re heavily rely on uh, government funding, state and federal funding to keep our running. But um, we do have to say, and Rob could probably speak to this as well, is that this year we, we did have an increase in the overall state budget for sexual violence funding um, than in the past, um, but there, it seems like there is never enough. You know, this year alone, um, we, our agency, Family Service League, um, we overall will spend about $300,000 in counseling fees that um, are subsidized. So we don't collect those fees, and sexual violence survivors are entitled to free counseling through our program. Um, so we, we struggle every day to um, provide the services, but they're very important. Now, the programs like you know, the Shawnee Baraka Center is a great place because that's um, office space for us and space for people to come forward. So the, the NORC is doing its part in putting money into these areas. Now, we just hope throughout the county, throughout the state, we could see more of a trickle down effect of that as well. Do you receive any private donations? We do. Um, but again, it, it's it seems like that because of the Me Too movement, there has been more of an emphasis and people are more interested in helping and supporting sexual violence, domestic violence programs. Um, but we are still grossly underfunded for what we serve. Mr. Mayor, how, how are you funding the, uh, the, the Shawnee Baraka uh, Women's Resource Center? How's that being funded? Well, through city resources, through budget that we have in, in the health department and police department and, you know, other opportunities we have to do that. And we have to figure out you know, other funding sources, more opportunity to provide resources. We talk about this all the time. How do we raise money uh, and have a separate uh, kind of budget? We don't have a separate budget for the Johnny Baraka uh, Center. We uh, use the budgets of other departments to supplement the kind of work that's going on over there. Even though there's serious, there appears to be an, an increase in the number of people who are coming forward seeking help? Right, and so that's why we... We put our employees over there. So these are these are city employees that are over there, that that it, that could be in the police department, that could be in the health department, that could be in any other department. We put them over in the Shawnee Baraka Center, uh, so they can work there uh, around those issues. We just need more, uh, obviously more employees and more resources, and uh, you know we have to figure out how to raise those resources. Uh, Mr. Ambrose, you have to have staff there, though. You have a a, a, a police department there. How many how many? Members of the uh, public safety department, do you have there? Uh, we have uh, three, uh, four superior officers there, and approximately uh, fourteen detectives. Fourteen detectives, correct. And any idea how many cases they handle through there a year? Would you uh, say? Yeah, uh, they they handle anywhere up to about six thousand. Uh, it's not only rapes; it's child abuse, it, it, it's stuff like that. But uh, it, it's about six thousand cases total. 
Six thousand cases. About six thousand. And just in that area of the city, or is it all over the city? All over the city. All over the city. Right. Do you have people coming to the Shani Baraka Women's Resource Center from all over the city? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So not just from the South Ward or no, the West Ward. No, people come from all over the city. People talk to me from all over the city that have been there. So yeah. And is this the only center like that in the city? Absolutely. It's the, it's the only one we have of that kind. I don't know. It may be the only one that we have in the county. I'm not sure, but <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> is the only one like that, Chris? Well, we are exclusively the sexual violence program. So every right. county has a sexual violence program right. and a domestic violence program shelter. Um, but for the comprehensive one-stop shop, yeah, um, right. yeah, it is, is more unique there because there's other services besides just sexual violence, domestic violence. There's job, career coaching. There's HIV services. So people could go there for other things besides just reporting or a sexual assault, domestic violence incident. Right. Do you think, Mr. Mayor, that people are going there looking for resources and knowing that this this is a one-stop center that, look, if I go there and, and, and get help in, in terms of domestic violence, in terms of uh, a, a sexual assault of some kind, mm -hmm. not only am I talking to a potential counselor getting some help, but the police are there, too. Well, I, know, I think they know the police are in the building yeah. uh, as well. Uh, they might not know all of the services that they may have access to when they walk in the building. Uh, when they walk in there, hopefully they, they realize when they leave out of there that there's a plethora of opportunity and folks that are there that are ready to support them, uh, you know, with all the issues that they may uh, be encountering. So uh, people come in there just f for help. Mm -hmm. Like any, they see a building, it looks nice. It's the Shining Brock Women Resource Center. It's dealing with domestic violence, other issues. They may know that on its face and they walk in there looking for help and may leave out of there with other kind of, of services at the same time. Services to help them get through the trauma. Right. Robert, I want to bring you back into the conversation here. We were talking about funding just a few minutes ago. What's it like funding these different centers, these different outreach places where people can come and get help? Well, it's, I mean, we know that across the state, uh, 50 there's over 50% of rape crisis centers have a waiting list. And if you think about the implications of that, folks seeking crisis services having to wait for uh for those services to become available. Um, hold, hold on for, a second. What, what do you sure. mean, wait for services? So there's a waiting list for counseling services um, at 50% of programs across the state because the capacity just is not there. And if we think about um, funding, perhaps not keeping up with the demand, as we see increases in reporting uh, to law enforcement, re increases in folks seeking services from our local programs, um, the funding should increase to to help build that capacity to meet the demand. Uh, and we are grateful for the additional $500,000 that was uh, allocated in the state uh, budget for this fiscal year. Uh, but certainly the fact that there continues to be survivors waiting for critical services uh, means that there still needs to be more funding and more partnerships with, uh, with municipalities as a uh, Christine and Mary Baraka have articulated with uh, with the center there in Newark. Uh, those programs are initiated. Uh, uh, they are initiated. Ah, excuse me. Um, they are innovative. Um, they are uh, creative, and they are there to meet the demand in their in their communities. Um, and they are great models to to look to replicate elements of that uh, across the state to help uh, ease some of this waiting list. Christine, you don't have a waiting list, do you? Um, we currently don't because we rely on volunteer licensed therapists. We have very dedicated staff, so we have therapists who don't get paid who volunteer at our office to see clients. So currently we do not have a waiting list, but we're fortunate for that, um, that we have such good people that are committed to this, that and they're, they're licensed, but they really feel the need for this. So we really rely on the community support to make sure that we don't have a waiting list. But we're, we're very close to being on a waiting list. You know, uh, if a funding stream gets cut at, at any day, we could say, you know, we, we have to look at, can we continue to provide these services? If you didn't have those volunteers, right. would you have a waiting list, I guess? Yes, because we only have enough funding to pay for uh, two professional counselors for sexual assault, and that's actually pushing it with a very low salary. Well, wow. Robert, uh, when you mentioned a waiting list, how long are these waiting lists in, in, in some of these places, and what are victims doing instead of getting help if they're on a waiting list? I mean, it varies across the state. I mean, we know, we know the CDC has determined that there are 1.8 million survivors residing in New Jersey alone. Um, and when we look at the, the, the number of folks who are actually coming forward reporting to law enforcement, or even those that are seeking um, services in our local programs, we know that 
they represent just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, and one of the initiatives we're, we're currently uh, working on with support from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is to conduct a statewide needs assessment so that we can determine that for the folks who are not engaged in our services or not reporting to law enforcement, what are they doing? Um, we know, I, I, listening into the earlier part of this, uh, this program, I know there were uh, conversations about the opiate crisis. Um, we know that folks who have experienced trauma uh, often are more uh, vulnerable to developing addiction, uh, mental health concerns. Folks often seek treatment for those primary, what they identify as their primary concern, uh, when underneath the, the, the contributing factor is this exposure to trauma uh, right. and in our, our focus, sexual violence. Uh, and Director uh, Ambrose stated earlier that we can't arrest our way out of this, um, that we need comprehensive measures to, to address the root causes of, of these problems and specifically like perpetration of sexual violence. Uh, and that's why one element that our programs do across the state is, is sound prevention work, addressing the risk factors for perpetration. So, so we're raising uh, next generation of, of, of our members in the community, of our residents to not perpetrate sexual violence um, because it's, we, we want to make sure that the interventions are there for folks after they've experienced this, um, but the most proactive and soundest investment is in preventing it from occurring in the first place. Mr. Mayor, uh, thank you, Robert. Mr. Mayor, uh, when you start talking about uh, what Robert is talking about here, about trauma uh, in a place like Newark and, and uh, prevention, uh, how does the center work, as far as we know, in terms of preventing uh, these kinds of crimes, these kinds of assaults in, in a place like Newark? What we try to do as much education as we possibly can. You know, we, uh, you know, try to reach out to schools and other uh, opportunities like that to do as much as education to help people identify signs of abuse, things that are going on, uh, you know, relationships that are that are not healthy, uh, all, all of those things. Uh, you know, uh, there's a group of women who even go to the schools to speak, right? So, uh, you know, as as much as we possibly can, we do. We we need to do more, but. You know, we have been talking about that, you know, in our Friday meetings about how uh, to come up with even more strategies around prevention as it relates to domestic violence and sexual assault. Trauma is a serious thing in a city like Newark. Yeah, we that's why we organize in this whole trauma informed care thing and mostly, uh, you know, around violence. And it's mostly been around gun violence and, right. and, and you know, that, that kind of assault. You know, and, and we've been talking le recently about how to make sure that we incorporate in uh, domestic violence and sexual violence uh, in these categories as well. Because I think we've been doing a great job in, in lifting up the kind of uh, trauma that's related to violence that takes place in people's household uh, and in their community, even reporting uh, traumatic incidents to schools when kids are involved in kind of violent or close to violent situations in off school hours, reporting it to the school and trying to get school protocols in place so they can be able to deal with kids like that. And we should have the same uh, kind of impact and fervor as it relates to sexual and domestic violence as well. Uh, your, is it your goal to have Newark become a trauma-informed city by 2020? Absolutely. We are working around that. You know, we even have people going to the hospitals now, uh, you know, when when they're victims of violence, uh, to begin to talk to them and give them services. One, to prevent the kind of retaliatory thing that is usually associated with that, but also provide people with services that, that we know they've been victimized by violence. I mean, there's... Uh, we, we, we talk about in the school system now, the superintendent and those folks trying to introduce the whole trauma-informed kind of care uh, in the school system. Um, you know, and, and we want to be able to do that in all the institutions that the city is responsible for. And I think, uh, well, I know domestic violence and, 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 and sexual assault is a part of trauma. I mean, I mean, I lost my sister to domestic violence. I mean, it traumatized my entire family. And we still traumatized from that. You know, my, my mother, you know, probably the worst who, uh, you know, experienced high levels of trauma uh, because it is my, si my, my, my other sister, you know, uh, the, the one who's living, you know, the other, you know, the other ones that are living. Th those things uh, have a deep, deep kind of effect on people's lives. And they res people respond to trauma differently. And, uh, you know, you can't l allow it to go unchecked. So a lot of the other issues we see in the city, you know, uh, is a result of people growing up in situations of trauma. Did anybody in your family get any help reach out for help after well, what happened I mean, what, one of my sisters is is uh you know getting uh help i mean 
she's probably the 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 more uh, prudent amongst us all to to go and seek that. But um, there's always one. Yeah, <laughs> there's always one. What does a trauma informed city look like for Newark? Well, number one, to realize that there's uh, people who are experiencing situations that are traumatic in their life. They're violent situations, situations that people see, that they encounter, things that they grew up with that may affect their behavior uh, or, they, or the way they react to certain situations or their ability to learn or their ability to concentrate or their ability to focus, right? Or the ability to have a, a healthy relationship with another, with another individual, right? And uh, understanding that helps us to put things in place to kind of mitigate those things uh, and allow them to function in a society in a normal kind of way. Uh, what, what, prior to that, we have this stigma or, or this thing that, you know, we grow up so tough and so hard, we can handle anything. But really, that's really not true. I mean, my mother used to say that Superman is not real and neither is kryptonite. But she would say that in a sense that, like, all of the stuff you're going through, it, 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 because you got through it doesn't mean you're Superman. You got through it, you know, but ultimately there are some things that happen because you encountered these situations and you have to address them. Certainly do. Um, Christine, we have just a couple of minutes left here. I'm going to get your final thoughts on uh, what we're talking about tonight. Uh, we're talking about uh, uh, crime st- statistics in New York. One of the crimes, of course, rapes uh, increase, at least the reported rapes increase from 140 to 165. What do you need at this point to do a better job, a, a bigger job of helping people? Well, I think just being here tonight is what starts it. Um, just continuing the dialogue, having open and honest, uh, you know, conversations, collaborations with the police department, with uh, the mayor's offices of every municipality, and just having the focus that this is real, this is happening, um, and that we do need funding and we do need support um, to really keep people and the community aware that we're listening, we're here to support you, um, and we can if we all work together. You know, the mayor mentioned some of the prevention efforts. Prevention, you know, we do a lot of prevention work and we started as early as elementary school about healthy boundaries and, um, you know, in relationships. And that's really the the core of where we're going to be able to see some change is that early prevention and intervention. Um, So I think just support and collaboration and just talking about it. So thank you. Thank you for having us. Most welcome. Robert, you're on the phone with us still there. Uh, Your final thoughts there. Uh, Just, I think, increasing overall awareness about what it means to to prevent uh, violence and to raise a generation that has empathy, uh, that respects boundaries, that understands consent uh, in, a, in a comprehensive way. And you cannot start those lessons early enough, whether it's on the playground and not forcing somebody to go down the slide if they change their mind and just how that translates to in a relationship with somebody, somebody can change their mind um, and that doesn't entitle you to to compel them to do something. Uh, and those lessons will make a big difference uh, when you multiply them across the community. And let's hope, Robert, that some state lawmakers out there with their uh, uh, hands on the purse strings in New Jersey are listening with this waiting list that you're, that you're talking about. Yes. Robert, thank, thank you. you for joining us. Christine, you too. Thank uh, you. Mr. Ambrose, I want to thank you as well, and the mayor. You've been listening to WBGO, Newark Today, 88.3 FM. We've been talking about crime, some of the lowest crime statistics in the uh, city of Newark in the last five decades, some impressive numbers. But still, as you heard here tonight, a lot more work needs to be done in some of these areas. Rapes, of course, sexual assaults, one of those areas. But help, it seems, is on the way. We just need a little bit more funding, perhaps, from some of the state lawmakers and from the governor's office, and hopefully some of their Um, Some of their representatives were listening to this broadcast tonight. I want to thank you for listening and for participating uh, by Facebook and other means tonight. I also want to thank our staff members here, Ang Santos on the phones, Corey Goldberg, Operations, Alexandra Hill, Producer, Doug Doyle, Executive Producer, and from Newark TV Channel 8, Lincoln Anthony and Eddie Colonia. Got the names right, I think. I'm your host, Michael Hill. This is WBGO Newark.